example, um, at 195 hectares, Nine Elms is by far the largest regeneration zone in central London. It stretches from Lambeth Bridge down to Chelsea Bridge and it covers parts of Wandsworth and Lambeth. The proxi proximity to central London is evident and it's less than a mile away from Parliament. But as well as our central location, we are uh, very lucky to have three kilometres of uh, prime river frontage, uh, Battersea Power Station to the west, the new US Embassy coming into the area, new Covent Garden Market, an emerging cluster of tall buildings in Vauxhall. Our vision is to create a new modern sustainable district in London, a new piece of city, if you like, that benefits local people and contributes to London overall. In terms of scale, we have some pretty big numbers. Um, we're talking about £15 billion worth of investment, 6.5 million square foot of commercial space, which brings us 25,000 new jobs, and an estimated up to £7.9 billion contribution to London's economy. This is one of the unique characteristics of this area, um, multiplicity of land ownerships. We've got probably, we've got 30 major development sites, all at different stages, from planning, construction to completion now, in a variety of different hands. So we've probably got 12, 13 major landowners operating in the area. There are a few public sector assets, um, and delivery is therefore pretty much driven by the private sector. We're creating three uh, significant employment hubs, two town centres, one at Vauxhall, uh, and a metropolitan scale town centre at Battersea Power Station itself. But also in the centre, we've got a hub which is around the Embassy Quarter and the Covent Garden Market. While Vauxhall is highly accessible, uh, not reaching its full potential, Nine Elms is very different and is a ca um, really characterised by it's a very low density industrial area that's been declining for some time, very poor use, big land uses. So redevelopment on this scale, and particularly with the range of private sector partners, uh, it's not going to be delivered without very strong leadership and political will and partnership working. Our informal partnership is the Nine Elms Vauxhall Partnership, and it was established in 2010. The role of the leader of Wandsworth Council, uh, 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 Ravi Govindia, and Sir Eddie Lister, I think has been pivotal. But we've also got other heroes uh, in our partnership in terms of the leader of Lambeth Council, Michelle Dix, who's just left uh, from TFL, and a range of our landowners there, all working together to drive forward the scheme. So the role of the partnership is strategic leadership, which is really about creating the environment to enable development to happen, making sure that infrastructure is delivered when it's needed and that works alongside and with the grain of the development that's coming forward. We need to work across the two councils and a variety of land boundaries in order to make things happen. I, I would say that sometimes uh, that level of collaborative working can be quite challenging. And I always quote, we've, um, we've done a materials palette for all of the public realm in the area, um, which has involved three planning authorities, uh, three highways authorities and 12 different landowners all trying to come together and to agree this materials palette. Which it took a while. But actually, that was the sort of collaborative working that's necessary in order to get things done, and importantly, to build ownership. I'm just going to touch a little bit on housing now, and I think David set the context for this fantastically. We, we originally had a target of 16,000. We're now being challenged in the new amendments to the London plan to move that to 20,000 new homes in this area, which we do think is achievable. Um, we've got a variety of different housing forms there, and you can see some of these uh, from flatted developments on the river, uh, Battersea Power Station, uh, rebuilding some council homes at the city farm, but also uh, a variety of different homes coming forward in, in Vauxhall. At least 3,000 of those homes um, are going to be affordable. Um, that's it. Uh, we've already got 15,000 homes with planning permission, uh, and we've already got planning permission for 2,500 affordable. Uh, we have £73 million uh, pounds of commuted sums for off-site off uh, affordable housing, and that's really come from review mechanisms. That's been key about the commute. Uh, 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 and just 24 percent of those homes would have two bedroom plus. So what we're trying to do in this area of 20,000 in central London is actually build a variety of tenures uh, for a variety of income mixes in the area. So just in terms of where we are, you can't see this terribly well, but um, effectively affordable housing is being uh, negotiated on every scheme. So by 2016, in two years, we'll have completed three, our first 3,000 new homes. 
but by 2020, nine and a half thousand, so over half of our homes were expecting to be complete by 2020. This slide, I know it's a bit difficult to understand, but all the different colours represent a mix, the mix of uses that we, we're here. Um, and for us, what this really points out is the phasing of delivery. Uh, and the key message is, and this has changed quite a lot in the last couple of years, uh, the last couple of years have seen this enormous acceleration in terms of development. Um, and whereas before the bulk of development was going to happen after the Northern Line extension happened, what we're seeing is that happening before. So a lot of our scheme is now going to be complete within 10 years, subject, of course, to the market. I just wanted to touch on some of the, the, the important tools uh, to enable uh, us to move forward here. And I think key to the success of the development really has been uh, the GLA's uh, leadership and vision, working with two local authorities particularly, uh, and the development and the opportunity area planning framework. Um, and they, they also work really closely with the key landowners in the area, because that unity of vision and the establishment at that point of core principles and those core principles being changes of land use, uh, the move to central activity zone, uh, the urban densities that we expect for the area, but also the transport policy around the Northern Line extension, but also our public realm uh, strategy. I think it's been really essential in terms of driving that forward, providing clarity and certainty for investors. The other uh, document up there is the infrastructure study. And again, that's been a key part of our evidence base not just for the infrastructure needed to support this unprecedented growth, but also to set the tariff for all developments, the development levy that we're charging. That huge population growth anticipated, uh, uh, the huge population growth we're anticipating uh, means that we're talking about something like 1.2 billion uh, investment in infrastructure required, m the majority of that on the Northern Line extension, but something like 250 million on other infrastructure. But what was important about that document is it also showed that the area, the development in the area is sufficiently viable to make that happen. So our list of infrastructure requirements requ uh, uh, comprise schools, health, public open space. Um, and I think importantly for us, these are not just for the um, the new populations coming in, but absolutely for the existing population. And part of our infrastructure is also about improving existing. Um, so we've given you, I've given you a list there of some of those things. Um, and just following on from Basil's point, I think one of the biggest challenges that we've really faced and one of the biggest risks to the programme has been around utility provision. We need very substantial upgrades because of the increasing density in the area, including a new primary substation. Uh, that serves the whole of the, area, uh, the development area, and that's proved very hard to deliver in the current regulatory framework. We're absolutely working very close to the UKPN. We're absolutely sure we're going to get there. But again, one of the things, I think the learning points for developments of this kind is that you have to plan work around utility provision very early on. So we're also looking at housing, sports, leisure, uh, and what's not on that list, and actually, again, from my point of view, should have been on the list early on, arts and culture. However, I think perhaps the single most important catalyst for growth has, uh, has been transport, and it's been the Northern Line extension. So a little bit on that. This provides a new tube link for the area with two stations, one at Battersea Power Station itself, and one at Nine Elms on Wandsworth Road. That transport infrastructure has enabled us, uh, just that two-stop two extension enables us to increase densities uh, and has added uh, 17,000 new jobs, 7,500 homes and 20,000 new residents. We would not have been able to achieve the densities that we're looking for without that level of transport. It's also provided econo an economically feasible regeneration option for Battersea Power Station. And those of you that might have followed the history of Battersea Power Station and its 30 years of uh, attempts, actually the, the Northern Line extension was absolutely pivotal in making that scheme start working. Uh, sorry, I'm going to go back there. So I just want to touch a little bit on the funding package. And again, this is really about how the GLA, central government, local government, has worked with developers to make something pretty unique happen. So it's essentially a TIF, uh, and it's £1 billion worth of borrowing by the GLA against uh, developer contributions and the business rate uplift. And importantly, in terms of making this happen, it was underwritten by central government, who also uh, allowed the establishment of an enterprise zone uh, again to uh, enable us to do the TIF. So essentially, it's private sector funded, 
Um, but it's been the support of all three tiers of government that's really been the driving force behind that. Uh, three years of planning, detailed planning design are now completed. We've completed the public inquiry and we're just waiting for Sec uh, Secretary of State approval for that, which we hope to get in September. We'll start on site next year and that will be complete, we think, back end of 2019, beginning of 2020. So, uh, uh, almost there. Uh, another core principle of the Opportunity Area Plan framework has really been about the public realm. Uh, and creating the environment for new people to come and want to live in the area for the existing population, but also for a working population. And core to that has been the delivery of new five hectare park, which stretches from Vauxhall to Battersea Power Station, the opening up of the, uh, the Thames River Path, and the creation of linkages and new routes to increase permeability and accessibility of the area. It's really uh, an area that's cut off at the moment, particularly by the railway viaduct, which slices through, so punching through north-south routes uh, a key part of our uh, strategy. Um, just to touch a little bit more on the park and some of the challenges in this sort of uh, regeneration environment. Um, so that land is actually in private sector ownership. Uh, it's, uh, but actually it's in three uh, private sector ownerships. Um, and it touches on three others. So enabling that to happen has really been about, again, setting out the principles, the planners really working with those developers, uh, securing that park uh, as a public park in Section 106 agreements. But I think for the developers, really making the case about how this adds value to all of their developments. Um, and the, the thing that we're working on at the moment is establishing a single management structure across those land ownerships uh, to make that happen. Uh, so. This is my final slide. Sustainability is such a huge, huge issue um, and uh, hugely important to what we're trying to do in the area, both in terms of economic, social and physical sustainability. That instead of uh, covering all of that, I'm just going to touch on some of the uh, examples of practice that we're employing. So while all schemes have their energy strategies, uh, the US Embassy is going to be an exemplar and I think one of the most sustainable buildings in the country. It's fantastic but, uh, for, uh, for many reasons. Um, it's got the use of PV panels on the facade, uh, uh, ground source heat pump, um, grey water recycling. But importantly for us, it's also about the role that it plays across the whole of the development. Um, the area's massive increase in density means that there's uh, insufficient drainage capacity. Uh, so we either need to provide a new sewer and pumping station, which of course in a very urban context is expensive and land hungry, or as we're currently doing, working with our public realm strategy, uh, looking at ways of uh, designing both soft and large, uh, hard landscaping to slow attenuate storm release water flows into the Thames uh, across different development parcels. Much cheaper. Uh, much less hand, land hungry and I think much better for the environment. And the embassy and their little moat at the front is actually core to that. But the embassy is also integral to deliver of a heating network. Uh, 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 the embassy uh, creates surplus heat, so what we're doing is working with the embassy and three adjacent developments um, currently to uh, basically link up all four of those developments in a district heating network. It's worth saying that Battersea Power Station itself, which is 40 acres of 2 million square foot of commercial space and 3,500 residential units, has a, a central heating system, a, a central heating plant for the whole of the development. But what that's also looking to do is link up north to Pimlico and then across to Westminster, but also south into this first US embassy based uh, heating network. So those plans are really beginning to evolve now. And just my final point, but I think probably one of the most important to us is the jobs agenda. We have a huge uh, opportunity here, 25,000 new jobs. Um, but we also have, through that interim period, 22,000 construction jobs. And ensuring that, uh, that Lambeth and Wandsworth residents benefit from these opportunities is, key, is our key local priority. So Wandsworth and Lambeth have already established job brokerages supported by an employer-facing joint coordination unit uh, and a training provider network. It's early days, we've, we've just set that up. It's been one of the first priorities for the partnership. But I'm pleased to say that progress is already being, beginning to made, uh, be made. All of our developments sign up to an employment charter uh, and through their section 106s, they all have employment and skills plans. We already have, just at this very early stage of development, 185 apprenticeships committed and 40 local people actually working on sites. Small numbers, but it's the start of something much more.